Walt Smith. He is the CEO of Walt Smith International. If you haven't bought your raffle tickets, he gives away a free trip to Fiji every year, and they'll talk about that here in a second. But uh, Walt has spent uh, decades in the hobby growing and shipping corals all over the world. And um, today he's going to be talking about what is happening to the trade currently in our unknown future. So let's welcome Walt. Good morning, everybody. I, I always say good morning, but this time it's legitimate. Um, before I begin my talk, I'd like to bring uh, Kelly and Scott up here for a second. They are the people that won the trip last year, and um, they just got back. They, they decided to wait until a week before Magna to take the trip. So they just, just got back. You can see they still have a suntan. And they're going to tell you a little bit about you know, what, what's provided in the trip, how it works. Um, and um, when they get up here, we'll do it. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> and she's buying more tickets, so watch out. <laughs> okay. Well, we had a wonderful time in Fiji, and the trip that Walt uh, pr provides and plans is just amazing. We, um, we visited three different resorts on different parts of the island, which was incredible, each one of them totally different than the others. One was um, a really big resort, you know, kind of like a Marriott type thing, but really family-oriented. We brought our kids, ended up bringing our kids with us, which was good and bad. <laughs> it was supposed to be our 25th anniversary, but eh. We, we brought, they got diving, uh, dive certified before we went, so we did a lot of diving, which is unbelievable. Yeah. I've been diving for 25 years and I've never seen diving like this. It's amazing. Best diving I've ever seen. Uh, the coral there is plentiful. I wish I could have grabbed some and brought it home. Um, I really thought about packing some in the suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. And to... you wind up in jail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, I, then I'd be back in Fiji. But uh, definitely a trip we'll plan on going back. Um, a note, the dollar's very strong, so it's very economical to go to Fiji. Uh, it's a straight flight from LAX, and uh, I'd definitely go. It, it's okay. beautiful. So there you have it. And how many tickets did you buy last year? One? <laughs> <laughs> I bought we 20, had, I bought that one, the ticket. Yeah, I think yeah. we've done this about 14 times, and um, there have been people that have won on just one ticket. So yep. don't be shy. Go ahead and put some of them into the Fiji and we might be bringing you up on stage in the banquet night, and it'll be a big, big enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Okay, so my talk is uh, going to be in two parts. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with the industry and what's happening around the world, and, um, and then I'll lead into uh, alternative uh, sources of. Um, you know, energy that we can spend, uh, that we've taken everything that we have learned in this hobby and use it to something use, you know, put it to something useful. Uh, what you're looking at here is a map um, of the world that, you know, back in the early 90s, uh, we had a lot of collection stations that kept growing and growing, especially in the South Pacific. And where you see those uh, stop hands, is areas that uh, either are not uh, operating anymore, are in perilous danger of quitting, or have had history of uh, bans. So uh, one of the, and you'll see Florida there, that's where you start with, uh, you know, where they, back in the you know, early years, um, they, Florida was the main source of live rock, and then uh, they banned that. So, um, but the very first ban came right after I arrived in Tonga in 1989, uh, I was shipping uh, corals and, you know, getting a reputation for corals. That was just the first year that um, corals really were entering into the market because up, up until then, the technology wasn't available to keep them alive. So um, about two years after m me being there, Tonga placed an immediate ban on all corals and rock until, and, until a scientific committee could be brought in and study the resource and, and you know, establish sustainability. Um, the report took about nine months while we sat there shipping Fiji damsels um, and not much else. Um, more and more, com and as soon as the studies were done um, and we got a green light, more companies started entering into the country. Um, they only had five allowable licenses, 
But over the next 12 years, more than 10 companies had come and gone and replaced licenses that were vacated because it's a very hard country to do business in. So um, there, there was a high failure rate in Tonga. Um, the quota was constantly moving all through the years. Um, I finally closed my company in 2010, but there's still three or four companies there operating today. Uh, but their current quota is only 150 corals combined between hard corals and soft corals allowed per, per week per exporter. And then you've got, um, like I was just talking about, in, in December of uh, 1994, the state of Florida officially bans a collection of live rock um, and that uh, kind of spurred us to start you know, exploring doing some live rock in, in Tonga. I was kind of against it in the beginning. It didn't seem interesting enough to me. Um, I was more interested in the corals that we were exploring with and trying to get to people successfully. Um, so the focus of the aquarium industry um, you know, with the environmental activist groups um, is starting to have an impact at this time. Uh, the aquarium industry has difficulty, di difficulties protecting itself against these actions and because of the lack of scientific data to prove a sustainability ha of our harvest, uh, because there wasn't much data at the time, it was very easy. Um, you know, just to shut it down with, it, with, with, it, with a few activist groups, uh, you know, in Washington or whatever. Um, and like I said, it's very easy for the activists to win this battle. Uh, along came Samoa, right after, not, not long after Tonga was going. Uh, in fact, before Tonga was going, American Samoa had uh, a collection station that was only supplying fish. That started in about 1987. Um, so. We had American Samoa and we had Western Samoa. Now, for those of you that don't know, um, they're, they're two separate countries. American Samoa is, an, is a U.S. territory, and Western Samoa is true Polynesia. It's its own country uh, of, of Samoa. Um, and in 1997, the management, uh, there was a management directive issued by the cabinet of the government in Western Samoa to limit the activities of the aquarium trade. And first they started with, you know, no more fish, and only rock, and that lasted two years, and in 1999, uh, they closed the rock down entirely. So here we have two stations that were operating, supplying the, supplying the industry and, and your tanks with items that are now no longer available. And then, the, the, um, and then the, along after that, um, all the live rock in Tonga was banned around the year 2005. I can't remember exactly, but that seems about right. Um, and after a series of negotiations, at this time I was in Fiji, but my company was still operating in Tonga, and I had to go back and sit with the government. And what I found out was um, they, I came and gave them a presentation about a year before this ban about how all the live rock that we're making, and they decided that um, you don't need to harvest it anymore, you can just make it all. Um, and so the harvest was banned. And those varieties that you were all familiar with at that time included the Kalini rock, the branch rock, the slab, the natural with the plants on it, and the, and the, and the natural reef rock. All of those varieties went, are banned from the industry from uh, this day forward. And that represented about 30% of the trade um, in live rock. Um, we saw the Fiji rock, um, live rock, you know, start to expand at that point. Um, that, was, that was no secret, of course it would, with one of the major supply houses you know, drying up. Uh, but then in, just recently, um, in 2017, on the very last hour of business of the year, four o'clock, just before they closed um, for, you know, for the New Year holiday, um, my wife and I and my manager were sitting in LA on our way back to Fiji, and uh, we look at Facebook and there's a post that um, Fiji has just announced a, a total ban, imme effective immediately on all uh, live rock and coral, uh, either for collection or export. That was kind of a shock to me, and I did, really didn't know how to, you know, take that. And I said, "There's got to be a mistake. They 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 can't do that just overnight uh, with no warning." So I told my wife, "You know, you stay here because we were getting ready to take our, you know, after Christmas uh, holiday." I said, "I'll be right back. We'll still go on holiday." Uh, this is going to take a couple days. Um, I was in Tonga fighting with the government for four months while my wife sat in L.A. wondering what's happening to our life. So this didn't affect just us. Um, I know how to survive, but uh, we had to lay off 200 employees. Uh, those, uh, keep in mind those 200 employees, um, one working 
person in a family usually supports more than 10 people. So um, I've had what, you know, women that were supporting their disabled husbands with a lot of kids, and now suddenly they are all in poverty uh, with no hope uh, of an income until the government changed its mind. Um, on March 7th, we were able to negotiate with the fisheries uh, to get the ban lifted, which was great. We signed a contract with the government. We're all celebrating. This is wonderful. And then we went to environment to get CITES permits because that's how it works there. Fisheries monitors, you know, what, what we take and we report to them, you know, what we export every week. But it's up to the Department of Environment to issue the CITES permit, which is required uh, for any uh, species of coral um, and rock. They refused uh, to sign any of these permits because they decided it was time to make new laws. Now, I, I'm sure everybody knows how long it takes to make a law. We're not looking for any change very soon. However, just recently I'm hearing some positive news, but I've heard positive news all along. So I've answered about 500 people uh, have come up to me at my booth here and want to know what's going on with Fiji. That's why I'm spending a little bit more time on, on Fiji because it happens to be personal and I, and I know more about it. Um, but until today, um, no exports of live rock or coral have been, are, are allowed and there's only two exporters in Fiji. So the resource is immense. You just heard you know, the, the, the trip winners talk about how, the most beautiful coral they've ever seen. That is a fact. Uh, we have a huge resource and in fact, the two exporters, myself and, and, and the other one, are on opposite sides of the island, so we don't even use the same resource. Um, then, everybody is well aware, uh, it's been major news, you know, that, you know, the, the, the Hawaiian um, fish collection, which has been, you know, I think you saw, if you saw Bruce's talk this morning, you, you, know, you know, you know, a lot about this now, but it's been an ongoing battle for years, and uh, the other side finally, you know, had their way, and, um, and, just, and uh, one of the things I just read in the paper is uh, just la last week a state court gave the belief, uh, th this is from an activist group, um, you know, the fish populations of Hawaii uh, and the fragile coral reefs are reprieve by invalidating 131 active recreational aquarium fish collection permits. Um, this is how they went about achieving, um, you know, the ban. They just stopped issuing the permits. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't people still there collecting fish, but as soon as their permit runs out, and it's sporadic, um, they're no longer allowed to uh, get a new permit. So eventually, the, the, unless something happens to the positive, there will be no more yellow tangs on the market. Um, and the, the sad part about this is Hawaii had the most detailed um, scientific data to prove how sustainable the industry is there. Uh, but uh, they, they were overridden by a motion. Um, you can imagine if somebody knocked on your door today and said, um, would you like to save the coral reef from being destroyed? Uh, just sign this paper. You're gonna sign the paper. And that's pretty much how they were able to achieve what they wanted with no data um, whatsoever to prove that their claims are true. And then, Indonesia follows Fiji with a ban. That happened in May, um, and it, almost in exactly the same way it happened to Fiji. It happened overnight. Uh, they stopped issuing uh, the medical certificates that are required um, you know, to, to accompany the shipments that everything was in, in, in good, healthy condition signed by the government, and they stopped issuing those. And um, nobody really understood, and since I'm not in, in, in Indonesia myself, I don't have you know, the bottom line uh, answers of what's really going on, but from what I can tell from everybody I talk to that's over there, and I'm talking also to a U.S. ambassador that's there trying to find out more, um, they don't know, they don't have any answers, and there's, they're talking about maybe 2020 before they straight, straighten it out. I hope that's not the case. But if you think about it, no more, Fi no more Fiji coral, no more Indonesia coral, that's over 80% of the market. So what's gonna happen next? Uh, the only, only countries exporting coral now are the small amounts from Tonga that, you, that we just talked about and Australia. So our industry is in, in danger and it's up to us to do something about it. And in groups like this, everybody in here has the ability to contact someone and, and let people know what's going on. Um, 
you know, the proper way to enforce a ban, which didn't happen in any case, uh, it was except maybe Hawaii, but uh, they, they went through the legal channels um, and, and won a, a case they shouldn't have. But the importance of science, you know, science-based ban, any ban or reduction of quota on corals should be based on good science. Uh, this is a requirement under various international agreements that most of these countries have already signed. Uh, before any ban is enforced, an assessment of the status of the resources should be carried out first. That didn't happen. Uh, when the livelihood of hundreds of individuals is at stake, the government has a responsibility to base their decision to ban based on good science rather than emotion. That's a responsibility that the government has to their people. Uh, Fiji had no studies, Fiji no studies were carried out by government and a ban came as a shock to business and employees who finally suddenly found themselves out of work. The same thing with Indonesia. Do we have a public image problem? Well, I've been seeing this picture for at least 20 years and it keeps surfacing and keeps surfacing. This is the exact kind of ammunition that the activist groups need. Um, and this is not a good sign. There's been people through the years fighting against cyanide. We don't use cyanide in, 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 uh, in anywhere in the South Pacific that I'm aware of, either my station or any of the other particip participating countries. But um, in Indonesia, it's still pretty prevalent. And the Philippines, it's, it's, from what I hear, it's dying down, but it's still, it still is there. And then there's this picture. If you, look, if you can see the dates there, this picture was taken in 2000, 2010, okay? The headline in the papers just, in, j just recently, when is that, um, at, you know, in, in, in April, uh, when they finally got the permits revoked, um, the headline in the papers were people are killing millions of fish each year just to stock aquariums. It's a revolving door of cruelty and destruction. This is the message being put out there by people that would oppose everybody in this room. And from what I know of this industry and what I see when I come to these MACTAs every year, we have a lot of dedicated people that love what they do, and this room shares more awareness about the coral reef than a group of scientists or a group of activists who just want to talk about, you know, everything bad and how we should stop everything and not keep you know, fish in little boxes. Um, they don't take into account the value of, of, of the awareness that we create. They don't take into account um, all of the education that, that, that comes from this. And an example, uh, we have always uh, uh, sponsored school trips in our warehouse in Fiji. We see about 5,000 students a year. Um, and they come through in the buses and they run through, you know, the warehouse slapping on all the tanks and giving the fish heart attacks. But the, um, the bottom line is they walk away. We have two marine biologists on staff that sit with the students once they're through running around and, and getting excited. And we teach them a little bit about the marine life. We allow them to touch some of the animals like starfish and things they can't do much harm to. And then they go back to school and they write letters back and send colored pictures that, that they drew in class about the wonderful field trip they had. And over the years, um, some marine biologist graduate students would come to me and say, you know, could I have a job in your company? Well, we'd like to hire people you know, with education, especially in marine biology. And we hired, uh, we, we did hire two of those people. And turns out after they were working for us, uh, he, he, one, they, they came up to me, and this is at different times, a couple years apart, and said, you know, I came here as a student to this warehouse and saw all the fish, and I made up my mind that day I wanted to study marine biology so I can come back here and ask for a job. And I wanted to work in this place. To me, that was, you know, I, I get goose pimples now thinking about it because that's, that's the value we have. That's what we can promote. We can promote, you know, how the ocean works, how the animals relate to one another, why is a coral reef important. All of that you guys are learning right in your living room. And that's a, that's a very important message to get out there. So a summary of the Pacific trading. Uh, in the 1960s, a Hawaiian fishery began and now it's in perilous danger. In the 70s, early 70s, the marine aquarium started in the Pacific, first in Fiji, and then in Kiribati. Fiji closed operations uh, in the mid 70s and then began again in 1987 uh, with fish only. Um, in, the 70, in 73, the Marshall Islands, mostly flame angels, um, 
and uh, right up until the, the early 90s, I, I think the flames are still coming from the Marshalls. And then we've got, uh, in the 90s, they started doing, you know, the live rock that everybody was familiar with that no longer exists in the marketplace uh, today. Uh, that was the Marshall Island live rock. Um, in 75, Solomon's joined the trade uh, with fish only, closed a few laters, uh, a few years later, and another operator began in the mid-90s. Mid and then um, now they're closed due to government complications and a lot of problems uh, trying to do business in the Solomons. Um, in American Samoa, it was fish only, um, and Western Samoa, Samoa rock only, both now closed. Palau started with, over the years, stop and go, stop and go, with fish and cultured clams. Uh, they never did coral. Um, and the Cook Islands, with fish only, is still successfully running today. Um, um, then in Tonga, and then Vanuatu in 89, uh, federal states of Mi Micronesia, more and more South Pacific companies started opening up right about the same time. Um, and Indonesia just started shipping coral after Tonga began because of the population, or, or uh, the popular, popularity of the Tongan corals. Suddenly people were able to keep them alive and Indonesia said, well, we can do that too. So now we have that um, you know, supplied to the trade. Uh, Fiji began with, uh, in 93, Fiji began with rock only, and then added a few years later the, the coral and the fish and everything else. Um, and then in 2017, the Fiji ban on coral and rock. 2018, the Indonesia ban on coral and rock. And now, two th and 2018, March, the Hawaiian legal system stopped issuing permits to the aquarium fish collectors. To date, out of the 12 countries mentioned above, uh, in the Pacific participating in the aquarium trade, nine have either a total ban placed on them or have been severely impacted by government policy changes. So is this the end of an era? With more and more bans in place by uninformed government officials that can create hardship to the exporters, we are starting to see many businesses fail, both internationally and domestically. You know, I have customers I used to sell to that sold only, only coral. They're out of business. I've talked to a few of them just here at, at this MACNA. At this point, only, like I've mentioned before, only Australia and, and Tonga remain. And my prediction, the industry will begin to morph into a more domestically based supply chain using the knowledge they have gained from the, over the years uh, of dedicated, by dedicated coral farmers within the tropical regions uh, where, where the coral farming actually began. How can we turn this into a win-win? The remaining coral farmers in the tropical regions can use their expertise for reef restoration work and ecotourism, but that's really using the knowledge that we've gained in this industry um, you know, to help the environment and to help local economies, possibly. But how, do, how would that benefit um, all the people in this room? How would that get you know, animals into your tanks? Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can transcend and understand more um, by supporting and understanding more about um, reef restoration work, which is where WSI began in 1998, starting to plant the, you know, the first coral farms. Um, today, uh, based on the momentum that we built at the last MACNA last year, we were able to gain a lot of support. Um, and uh, YMAS was right, at, right there at the beginning of it. Um, with, with a nice large donation that helped us uh, help the aid project get momentum. And right after that, um, many other companies that you see here have followed and, and, and private donations from individuals, there are too many to mention on this screen, um, came in and now we have uh, an organization that is able to finance um, useful scientific data that helps the industry understand more about you know, what we're doing, but not only that, um, we, we, we now have a budget to hire scientists to come in and uh, do a study on all the work we've been doing over the last 20 years um, to really um, have a, a, a beautiful report written, peer-reviewed port, report, that we, now we can go to the, to the larger funders, you know, the Googles and all of those, you know, people that love to give money, um, you know, to anything that uh, helps the ocean. Uh, and the report would begin with, you know, trying to answer the problem, you know, the coral reefs are facing unprecedented declines from a combination of global uh, and local impacts. And that would include bleaching, 
ocean acidification, increased cyclonic storms, um, decreasing in water quality, destructive fishing impacts, and uh, pollution and more. The solution is, um, can coral fragments be transplanted uh, onto a reef and restore the coral reef biodiversity? We have a lot to learn from that. Uh, the approach would be a coral assumption, I mean a core assumption of the, of the benefit of transplanting corals onto a reef improves the biodiversity. This project will measure change in coral reef ecosystem and plot and, and plots at plots receiving the coral transplants and ne nearby control plots um, that receive no transplants, including the natural and assisted rates of coral reef uh, recruitment and recovery. What this means is, and it's my theory, that on the plots that we actually put the, the, the coral, um, eventually they're going to reach maturity to where they spawn. Now, where, where do these gametes that go millions of gametes into the water column, where do they settle? So what we can do is we can put tiles and collecting basins on nearby reefs that haven't been planted and see how um, that, you know, see exactly how successful that part of the reef is as compared to other reefs that aren't near any one of the uh, plots that we've already transplanted. Um, we can also check the coral transplant survival growth rates. Uh, we're having su uh, amazing success, you know, more than 90%, probably closer to 100% of, of, of success rate on our racks that we plant today. Uh, we have more than, well, we have nine farm sites and we have probably, there's probably about between 20 and 30 racks on each site and each rack holds about 250 corals. So we have the ability to plant between 60 and 90,000 corals per year on these racks. And what happens to those after they've been there, you know, for nine months or so and they're growing up, we plant them on the reef and we vacate the, the, the real estate for new ones to come in and be planted on the same racks. So it's like a revolving door. And what we're seeing today and why this scientist was so interested in making a report um, and documenting all this is we see reefs that are growing near our farms that are far superior and more luxurious than nearby reefs that aren't, cl that, aren't that close to the farm. We also can, uh, you know, study the, the coral cover and habitat complexity over three years, you know, the diversity. Um, if you want to take this to a step further, we can start doing DNA testing on are those clones that we're replanting actually having an effect on corals growing from them in, in nearby reefs or right there at the base where, where they were planted. And then the macro, uh, macro invertebrate abundance and diversity, um, you know, the sea cucumbers and starfish and everything else, you know, that moves in, and the fish assemblage and diversity. We have film of, of reefs that are completely barren and two years after planting the coral, there's schools of fish living there. Um, this is very exciting you know, to, to the islanders because now they have a fishing ground where they didn't have fish before. And this really means something to them. Now they understand, you know, how this can be important to them and how this would benefit them. The uh, coral transplant survival and growth rates, a natural and assisted rates of coral and reef recruitment and recovery uh, and, uh, and the recovery will be, me be measured. Natural and assisted means, you know, the natural settlement that, that happens uh, from spawning and assisted are the ones that have the plug with the little thing that we actually screw into the reef and, and they grow there. We, we can actually study both rates. Um, we're also noticing that on some strands, there's a possibility that um, so, some of these strands are more uh, climate resistant, climate change resistant. Um, if we can study those clones and, and focus on that uh, and actually develop you know, some good science around this, um, there's a possibility that we may be able to start using only the corals that resist uh, global warming. Um, how wonderful will that be? Um, this is something that we need the science to do. I've been stumbling along with this, this coral farming idea and, 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 you know, since 1998, and it's not until we developed the, the I point here because my booth there's an aid sign. Um, it's not until we developed the aid, um, you know, program uh, project that we have the possibility to really learn uh, from what we've been doing for 20 years. Um, up until now, I've just been a hobbyist like all you guys, and um, it really means a lot to me to see science now getting involved in this project. Um, and we're, uh, we, we have the ability to do 3D 
uh, project, projections and, and study the habitat and you know, study the variations in height. Uh, a lot of things can be discovered um, and the benefits to the Bethnic ecosystems. Um, cover of hard and soft corals, algae, live cover, and uh, will all be monitored. And then the macroinvertebrates, the abundance and diversity of macroinvertebrates that move in. I had a talk yesterday uh, about a guy that's growing the, uh, the nudibranchs, and I'm interested in talking to him more about that as the reef develops and there's more food provided, these guys move in. And one of the most exciting parts about, about the study, by the way, this study is, is, is going to take place on September 21st. Um, Dr. Ben Fitzpatrick is coming across from Australia, and uh, the aid board approved uh, for him to come across. So we're all very excited to see what's going to happen. But he also has these, these cameras that are separated by a bar. So we'll be able to do, you know, study the fish assemblage and, the, and you know, the abundance and the biomass and diversity. Uh, on the quantified sites by, by a, a, they call it a swim diver operated stereo video, video technique. And it, that's kind of a, a, a picture of it that you see there. So um, if you have a chance to stop by our booth and talk to me about aid, I'd, I'd, I'd love to discuss it with you. Um, there, there are, uh, I think Bruce Carlson is here in the office. He's been a, a really big help um, you know, to us in the whole aid. He's, he sits on the board and helps us make decisions and um, I couldn't be more pleased to have somebody like him involved in this project. Um, it lends a lot of credibility. And, um, you know, I, just, I, I hope you've all enjoyed what I've had to say. Um, the outcomes um, is, is a detailed cons um, consideration of the effectiveness of the aid approach to coral reef uh, restoration uh, that will be achieved. Uh, the impact of coral transplants improving on coral reef biodiversity will be detailed and documented, including the Bethic ecosystems, like we just mentioned. Um, the study resulting in peer-reviewed documentation will enable the aid project to approach large-scale funding organizations and private donors. Um, this, this will position aid as one of the largest reef restoration projects in the world. And um, the, the, the amount of knowledge and the, and, the, and the size of the study platform we have to gain uh, from what we hope to accomplish here has is, is just never been done. And, and we're really happy to be at the beginning of that. So, Thank you, or should I say, Benaka Bakalevu. <laughs>